good afternoon, everybody. Uh, being the last speaker, most of uh, what I, most of my arguments have already been presented, and of course, it is the same debates which have been raging on and on for almost the last 20, 25 years. And uh, what I intend to do in my presentation is give you a very broad. Just I have just five slides, so give you a very broad overview of all the developments in both national and international policy and how we go about actually crafting a policy and legal regime to protect IK, uh, especially from the context of IPRs. And uh, when I talk of IK, I'm spe speaking specifically of IK of biodiversity. Um, this uh, IPRs, as we all know, are not a new concept have been in existence since the medieval times. But this whole IP, IP, I mean, IK and IPR linkage is very new, just about 30 years. And that too, it's mainly a developing country agenda. Uh, it is only when we had those instances of biopiracy when uh, India had to go actually out to fight, we realized that we needed laws to protect intellectual property. Otherwise, uh, by the principle of national treatment, we could not expect protection outside. And we realized that opposing patents abroad is far, far more expensive, as Dr. Shiva, she would, of course, she would tell you this. So in, in that interest, we designed an IPR framework in India, which looked at IK. Uh, TRIPS doesn't recognize indi uh, indigenous knowledge. But uh, there is nothing in TRIPS which says that IK cannot be protected. And we have basically used that flexibility in law to draft our own uh, IK regime. Coming to the imperatives for protection, the first is the justice and equity consideration. That being uh, any good law, if it recognizes the, property, the intellectual property of a knowledge creator in the mainstream. That law has also to recognize the intellectual property of which is created maybe in the fields and the forests. So that has equal value at par. It means it has to be, law cannot distinguish. So in the interest of equity, justice, and also conservation, this is this uh, linkage where when you protect the resource, you protect the knowledge. When you protect the knowledge, you protect the resource. This relationship between conservation of biodiversity and IP, as well as uh, preventing misappropriation. In fact, that has preventing misappropriation has been the main crux of the whole debate. But um, uh, what I would like to uh, say is that preventing from misappropriation is just not the only consideration if we want innovation in IK to happen. We also need to ensure that it is it flourishes in communities, innovation process goes on. And uh, there are these agents of change in indigenous communities, which are at work. I'll come to that later. Sorry. Uh, these are the other. The, Distinguished speakers uh, before me, they have already elaborated on this IPR protection, how it can take the form of defensive through disclosure, prior informed consent, documentation, assertive like the PPVRFR model, the GIs. And even here, there is this lot of debate on which is a better tool. Uh, there are many, uh, like there has been many studies which say that patents are not a good idea. Maybe, uh, maybe GIs are better suited to protect IK just because GIs, as we know, are collectively owned. And one good thing about GIs is that a GI cannot be assigned to somebody who is not from the community, to a non-local producer, for instance. So that is one positive point. These debates have been raging on and on to, with no conclusive results. And there has also been, along with the defensive and assertive, there's also this whole uh, debate on having more sui generis legislation, where you design an IPR regime to the context. And uh, the legal sanction for that is found in TRIPS, 
where it says that we could have, uh, we could protect plant varieties either through patterns or through sui generis systems or through both. And from this, uh, there has been like the Biodiversity Act, the Farmers' Rights Act, in fact, are all sui examples of sui generis legislation. Coming to protection, uh, the other kind of protection, just not IPR protection, we need measures to prevent erosion of this knowledge in communities. And uh, this is more so in the case of maybe the folk or to quote Robert Redfield's terminology, the little tradition scattered across the length and breadth of the country. There might not be that difficulties in preventing erosion of knowledge. The great tradition or the, the mainstream tradition, the codified tradition, but there are many problems with protecting the little traditions or in the country. Uh, these are the ongoing debates mainly that there is an inherent mismatch between the IP system and the nature of IK. IK mainly because IPR is an individual right, IK by nature is intergenerational, not limit with a limited period of time, no, and it is also collectively owned. And uh, there is this uh, debates going on that maybe yeah, apart from the mainstream legal system, we need to respect legal pluralism because indigenous communities also have their own systems governing the resource and the IK, the customary mechanisms. Maybe uh, we should have a more stringent <coughs> protection for and more respect for customary mechanisms, which unfortunately is not the case, maybe except in the six scheduled areas of the country where customary rights are recognized as law per se, but maybe not in other parts. Then there is also this whole debate, especially after the Nagoya Protocol, that we need more harmonized approaches internationally. And these debates have been going on in a number of fora, the WIPO, the TRIPS Council, and uh, there is uh, also this uh, realization that legal protection not enough but we need create, uh, to create conditions for IK to flourish. Uh, coming to some of the hurdles, and these are questions which are, are unresolved, and I think we, there is still much debate, discussion happening on, but no final solution. This whole concept of protecting IK through the customary system, but uh, it is easier said than done, because though our constitution recognizes customary law as having almost equal relevance as the other statutory law. That isn't the case. Because when a customary right has to be proved in courts, it is always a very, very difficult case. And we see that there is always these tests. There are a number of tests which <coughs> customs have to be, have to fulfill before they are recognized as law per se. And also, if we look at all our legislation, the forest, wildlife legislation, the Forest Rights Act, uh, in a way, is a departure from that conventional legislation. But if we see the rights to indigenous communities, which are, is given in our forest and wildlife legislation, those are not legal rights. Those are merely concessions or rights which are enjoyed at the state, at the will of the state and which could be withdrawn by the state at will. And uh, this is one lacuna in the law which the FRA has tried to address, but how far it actually goes in implementation, it's uh, this, uh, that is always open to question. Now coming to the development of an international harmonized approach, the most of the instruments lack what we call the legal teeth. The Nagoya Protocol is just a tiny step, but how far is it actually going to be successful is a question. <coughs> then there has been, again, this is mainly has been a developing country agenda in the TRIPS Council to push for a TRIPS-CBD link linkage where we have, uh, where TRIPS is amended when we have a disclosure mechanism for uh, both genetic resources and the associated IK, but that is almost a non-starter. Then also there has been this whole developing country position on extending the GI protection which is granted to wines and spirits to also protect uh, pro traditional products 
which have equal value maybe for example for instance we have in developing countries might not have uh, wines and spirits to protect but we have as equally relevant traditional pro uh, products then uh, this is also another realization that maybe we are talking about this whole IPR business, a bit, we are stretching it a bit too far when we talk of IK because the economic stakes in going for IPR protection may not be as high as, uh, per se, as uh, we believe the benefits to be. And uh, this is the case for we now have so many GIs, but actually all, but to maintain a GI is prohibitively expensive. And would it be worthwhile for each and every traditional product that we have? Or we, do we need to adopt a more rational approach, look at the, like do a cost benefit analysis before actually going ahead with pro protecting all kinds of IK? Then also, this is one thing I have raised in many other forums. This is one where uh, in any discussion on IK, what is what is exactly the role of the indigenous communities? That has been something, and there was this. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I'm criticizing this a bit too much, but we had this national consultation a few months back in Delhi, where the reports, the report of which was to feed into international policy, but there was not a single IK practitioner. Leave alone that there were not regional, local consultations. Just a national consultation is it sufficient? And uh, here, uh, like saying, saying that, we, uh, there is also this question that do indigenous societies actually have the capacity to negotiate, not only uh, take part in international negotiations, but even negotiate their contracts if they go for a, a contract to actually transfer their knowledge? Do they have, is there not a chances of misappropriation? One, uh, and uh, even there. Now, uh, this is again another problem, the forces of change in indigenous communities. Uh, it is, would be very unrealistically to, unrealistic to believe that there is always an ideal indigenous ecological ethos. And as times change, we cannot expect that indigenous communities are always sustainable and that indigenous communities always nourish their IK. That is not always so. And, uh, Especially like uh, since I have worked more on the Northeast, my, there has been instances where we see that the IK, it's fine. There is tremendous IK. There, um, in fact, some of these knowledge holders, in fact, uh, we have a project in Terry on protecting uh, legal protection for medicinal plants. And as part of that, we have been visiting Northeast. And some of the findings are that, yes, the knowledge holders say that we have herbs which are not which are not known and utilized in the mainstream system but which are useful to us that is not recognized in ayurveda but we have so much more than what is actually there but uh, this knowledge uh, it's very sad is only confined to a very few mainly the elderly people and if you uh, interact with the younger generation they would uh, look down upon this knowledge, saying this, this is not modern knowledge. We want modern knowledge, what they call is modern. So we have nothing, no business with it. And also you could say a sense of uh, a low self-esteem, a sense of disrespect. These are not, not even, and maybe because uh, the traditional knowledge holders, this, uh, the livelihoods means there is a need for ready cash and always transactions in, so as to say, this indigenous societies, they were not just the economic component was not imp that important. There were other considerations involved. But, uh, the, but as society changed, there is this need for ready cash in hand. And in such a situation, how, I mean, is it, uh, can we not apprehend a situation where maybe somebody from the community would have in, enter into secret negotiations, maybe to sell off some uh, indigenous knowledge, but not transfer the benefit to the community. There could be numerous instances of this nature. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to uh, con conclude my presentation. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.